good afternoon, and I thank you very much for having me. Uh, I feel very much like my presentation is going to be a uh, fairly tangential one to the uh, discipline of data governance generally, but I'm sure I can bring it back around to bring some relevance to you for this afternoon. So, um, what this presentation is about is bringing new approaches to digital problems, specifically using human-centered design to solve public policy problems. So, let's talk a little bit about the Policy Lab. Uh, we are Australia's first all of government policy lab. Um, we're based out of the Department of Finance and Services and Innovation, which is what it's called now. I believe shortly it will be called the Department of Customer Service. Um, and what we do is we work in the intersection between human-centered design and public policy. Our mission is to drive transformation in public policy, uh, beginning with digital systems and services. Specifically, what we want to do is make New South Wales a better place to live. And how we'll do that is we will empower the people and businesses of New South Wales by enabling to them to engage with the digital systems that affect, uh, make informed decisions, and control their own experiences. We'll enable government agencies to innovate and implement strategy through user-focused and user-centered design, and we'll leverage the opportunities presented by emerging technology. So one of the things that's very important to us is that we be open by default. Everything that we do, we try to treat, be transparent about it. We write up all of our projects, we publish all of our findings, the tools and systems that we build are available for reuse. The idea is that a rising tide enables all boats, and we want to enable that tide. So, to make all of that work, we've put together a team with a very diverse skill set, uh, with specialities including policy design, privacy and information governance, anthropology and ethnography, social sciences, and emerging technologies. When we don't have the skills that we need, we collaborate with partners across government and with academia. Um, the, the public service itself holds a wealth of expertise in niche areas, much like yourselves, and uh, we want to be able to go out and find those skills and bring them into the tent where that's when we need them for certain. Purposes. So, where we don't have the skills we need, we're more than happy to skill them. Um, we also work with industry and non-profits and academia to get the skills that we need. So, uh, within our own branch and within our own cluster, we can partner with uh, outfits like the Digital New South Wales Accelerator uh, and other agencies such as Service New South Wales. So, where we have come up with a solution that requires the delivery of a product, we can work with those teams to design and build and scale that product. So, that's a lot of high-minded idealism. Uh, how do we make good on all those promises? Uh, Human-centered design is a process that involves understanding the people that you're designing for and working with them to identify the problem and co-design the solution that is going to be tailor-made to suit their needs. In short, people, the, the users of your policy, the owners of your policy, and the subjects of your policy, the people affected by it, have to be placed at the center of the process. So we work with policymakers and users to identify the problems. We learn about what the users, all of the users, not just the policy owners, want and need. And then we work with them to quickly build and test prototype solutions so we can deliver a product that is backed by evidence and that we know will work. So this is what that looks like. We call this the infinity loop. Um, and it sums up how our process works. We ask and learn. We ideate, we work with our users to co-design what the possible solutions to their problems might be. We prototype quickly to identify the problems with potential solutions and work out which solutions might be the most viable. And then we can test and validate those solutions to ensure that we have a solid evidence base. Because we are bringing along our users with us at every stage of this process, they, their POV is the uh, center of every stage. Uh, so by the time that we get to a solution that we have tested and validated and are ready to scale, we know that it's going to meet their needs and we have an evidence base to justify it. So I'd like to talk a little bit about prototyping now. Prototyping at its core is very much about creating a safe space to take risks, to try new things and to enable uh, a safe failure. Um, you can't innovate without the ability to experiment. Prototypes don't have to be complicated. They can be as simple as a wireframe drawn on a whiteboard, or a basic cardboard model, or a role play that you develop. And you can use prototyping for a number of different things, but principally to identify solutions in a way that doesn't require you to do a lot of investment in terms of resources or time. Uh, you can try new things, see what works, and once you've worked that out, then you can put in the investment and the resources to make sure that what you put out into the world is going to work. It's important for me to point out that this idea, the Policy Lab, is not a new idea. We're part of a community. It's a, a global network of labs. 
But this is really great for us because we get to stand on the shoulders of giants. We get to use their experience and their resources to help us develop our own approach. Policy labs can be all kinds of things. Some are focused on bringing fresh thinking and creativity to business and government. Uh, for example, like the Nesta Lab in the UK. Some are very tightly specialised. So, say, City Studio in Vancouver is focused on making a single city, a single urban environment, more livable. More locally, the University of Sydney has its own policy lab, and they are focusing on addressing overarching policy questions to create a fairer and more democratic government. Uh, sorry, not government, society. So there's very high level and very uh, lofty goals there. Um, the University of Western Sydney is standing up a lab called Intergenerate, uh, with the digit eight, um, which will focus on enhancing young people's resilience, well-being, entrepreneurship, and economic participation, but bringing together uh, representatives of different generations to work on those problems. Within the New South Wales government, there are a lot of human-centered designers as well, uh, in individual clusters working on subject matter, uh, specific subject matter domains. So, transport has a future transport digital accelerator function, and they're working on human-centered design in delivery of future transport solutions. Uh, the education cluster has the Catalyst Lab, which is working on reforming the way that education is delivered. Uh, so. What differentiates us is that we're a whole of government function and a specific focus on digital services and solutions. So that's who we are, that's how we work. So let's get on to something different uh, and talk about some of the projects that we're working on now that you as uh, data governance professionals and information managers and records holders may find interesting. Um, these are some of the projects we've been working on in the last three months. Uh, when Andrew said we were established in 2018, uh, we were established on 22nd December 2018, so we have been around three months, uh, more or less about as of this week, and uh, it's it's been a very busy three months. In that time, we've uh, started work and we're about to deliver an Internet of Things framework governing the whole of government. Uh, we've been working on codifying digital, uh, codifying rules in legislation, regulation, and policy, and I'll get into that into a bit more detail later. Uh, working on uh, mapping the digital policy landscape, working out what policies apply in, in digital and how they relate to each other and different clusters. Uh, we are just kicking off our work on building a whole of government AI ethics framework. Uh, we've been working on whole of government cloud guidance, data strategy, and we're about to publish some technology, uh, some emerging technology guidance. So, little snippets on what new tech is out there on the horizon and how we think it's going to affect how government does its work. So I'd like to do uh, a little bit more detail into a couple of these. Let's start with cloud. So this project came out of a request that we develop a, quote, cloud policy. Uh, so as is our want, uh, we asked, OK, you've asked us for a policy, but what is the problem you were trying to solve? Um, we didn't necessarily get a very clear answer to that question. So what we did was we went to the users. Uh, we conducted a number of workshops and a number of follow-up interviews, and what they told us was, we have a lot of data, we have a lot of records, we want to use cloud services because they are cheaper and they enable us to do things that we can't do with our aging systems. So, we don't know what our requirements are. We know there are requirements, we know some of them, uh, but we don't have the confidence that we know all of them. We know there are numerous requirements. We know we have privacy requirements, security requirements, records retention and archive requirements, procurement rules, but they're not all in one place. Um, so what we determined from that was there's actually already a policy. In fact, there are several policies. What there isn't is a consolidated uh, view of what those policies and requirements are. And they're not necessarily surfaced to users at the time that they need to make a decision. So users told us what they wanted. They wanted consolidated, complete, relevant, usable, and timely information of what their specific requirements were. Great. So, that doesn't sound like a policy. That sounds like a set of FAQs, um, which is what we did. We developed a set of plain FAQs, plain English FAQs, that guide users through the cloud procurement process, but provide links to the specific policies that they will have to consider and comply with when they are making the decisions around cloud procurement. We're now going to work with Bidon New South Wales to ensure that this information is integrated into their platform so that people who are going through Bidon New South Wales to buy cloud products will see this information at the right time when they're making certain decisions about security around 
encryption around where their cloud uh, where their cloud needs to be hosted in order to meet certain requirements. I like talking about this example because it demonstrates the problem you need to solve is not necessarily the problem you think you need to solve, but also that the solution that you come up with doesn't have to be uh, complex and uh, high high tech in order to be innovative. All it needs to do is meet user needs in a way that hasn't been met before. Any questions about that before I move on? Yes. Um, how do you keep? I, um, yeah. One of the things that I think we strain against is how do you how do you take a, an adopter point of view in which to put people together? Like you, you can have your FAQs, but it's just another list. Whereas if you have someone say you need to look at it this way, and that will bring it all together. So the question was, how do you adopt a point of view in order to uh, adopt a delivery approach, I think, is what it comes down to. Uh, in this case, we had the opportunity to speak to a lot of really uh, informed users, uh, including chief information officers of various clusters, but also people who are on the pointy end of cloud procurement and of records management. Um, we did this in a couple of ways. Uh, in the first instance, we brought them into the same room together with the people who owned the policy, and we had them tell the policy owners about their particular struggles and about their particular pain points. And we went through a research synthesis process where we brought all of that together and presented it as insights that could then be delivered to decision makers. Um, but also we worked with them as we were developing the FAQ. So we said, great, we've developed these, we're gonna test them with you. We, we tested them with a a small but carefully curated user group, and they came along with us as we developed them. So we got to have their input as we prototyped and as we built it out. But further than that, we asked them specific questions about how do you want to receive this information? And we looked at the commonalities and their answers. And they were mainly, we need it when we need it. We need it when we need to make the decision. And we happen to have close ties with the Buy New South Wales platform, which is working on very similar related problems. How do we make people make decisions that are informed, that are educated, and how do we guide them through that process. So we looked for, uh, I hesitate to use this word, but synergies with other projects that we uh, were aware were going on. And we found a good opportunity to surface relevant information in bite-sized forms at various decision points throughout the procurement process. Now that's only going to work if you use Fire New South Wales, and lots of people are procuring cloud products outside of that, uh, outside of that, um, process flow. But you don't have to only make your information available in one form, so we're going to put it on Digital New South Wales uh, as well as a downloadable resource. Uh, ultimately, there's never only going to be one solution to your problem. And part of working out how you deliver it is asking your users, what do you need? And they're never all going to have the same answer. Does that, does, does that answer your question? Um, yeah. All right. Um, let's move on to rules as code, and, uh, oh, sorry, was that a question there? Great. Um, so let's move on to rules as code. Rules as code is a label that we have put on the process of finding black and white prescriptive deterministic rule sets in legislation and regulation and policy, and translating them into machine-readable languages. Uh, we went with rules as code rather than digital legislation or reg tech, because we're not working just with legislation or regulation. We are working with rules. Um, so why do we want to do this? Because we live in a society based on rules. Uh, but those rules can be hard for people and businesses to actually understand and comply with. They're often drafted in legalese. They can be complex and voluminous. They might just be in a 60-page PDF that is hidden in the corner of a website that nobody actually visits anymore. Um, but if we code them and we make them available for reuse, we open up a host of options. So we can build tools uh, based on these rules, such as software and websites that help people understand and apply and comply with the rules. We can make it easier for the regulated community to understand the rules and to build systems that automate compliance. Uh, we can create opportunities to automate and integrate rules into service delivery. So, for example, um, we are, well, Digital W South Wales is currently working on a project whereby they are creating a web form to enable people to sign their kids up for public school. 
previously, this was a very long uh, handwritten form. So it's easier to do it on a website. Great. You can automate some of the um, some of the fields to be filled in. That's great too. What if you were able to automate some of the other elements in which people might interact with the government? So one of the things we've been playing with is coding up the rules for the active kids voucher. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this voucher. I see a lot of nodding heads, so some people have definitely applied for it. But what this is, is if you have a child who's enrolled in the New South Wales public school and lives in New South Wales and is between the ages of 4.5 and 18 years of age, they can get a hundred dollar voucher once a year to spend on sports in some shape, way, or form, whether it be going to a karate class for the first time or signing up for a football club. Um, so we know we need to know certain eligibility requirements for a child to work out whether they are eligible for an active kids voucher. Now, if you are filling out all of this information to sign your kid up for public school, we know your kid's date of birth, we know where they live. We know which school they're going to, uh, so we know that they're enrolled in the school. So we have all the information we need to work out whether your child is eligible for an active kids voucher. Great. We could, if we code these rules and make them available via an API, create a system whereby your digital enrollment form works out whether you are eligible for a voucher and says, we think you're eligible for a voucher. Would you like to find out? You can click a button and go, yes, you are eligible. Would you like to apply? And you can click another button and have your application form autofill. You have created a seamless service using coded rules. And now, if the eligibility for those rules changes, you can change that in your rules engine, and those requirements will flow through your form. So now you don't need to change your education enrollment form at all. Now that's only one front end. What if you have multiple front ends? Um, let's step back a bit and talk about what we're dealing with currently in the present day environment. So you have human, human readable rules and legislation and policy. Lots of people are using those rules. So lots of people are interpreting those rules to work out what they actually need to do to comply. And then if they have business systems, lots of people are separately all trying to code those rules or somehow integrate them into their business systems. So this ends up with a situation where you've got lots of people doing lots of things to achieve the same outcome. Uh, it can develop inconsistencies because they're all trying different things and interpretations of uh, rules can vary, especially when they're legislative rules. Uh, and it creates a lack of confidence in the rules that you've done. Like, I think this is right. I'm not sure. I know it was right in the legislation, but as I've gone through the translation process to put it in my business systems, I don't know if I've made a mistake. This is where we would like to get to. If we enable rules to be developed, uh, coded rules to be developed at the same time the human readable rules are developed, we can put up a draft API at the time that we put up our legislation or regulation or policy for consultation. So let's say you were out there, rather than uh, looking at the legislation and spending time pouring over the provisions and then putting together a lengthy written submission, maybe you build a little front end to test and model the, the, the rules based on the API. And then, if you find that it doesn't work for your situation, you can base your submission on that, or even propose a rules change, uh, or, an API, or, or make a, a pull request to see, it, instead of making a written submission. So, it's, it's a different way of uh, testing whether it's going to work, a different way of running consultation. Um, but let's say, great, you're done with consultation, you're ready to go, you can put up your rules, your regulation, you can pass your bill and publish it as an act immediately and have your API officially yeah. ready to go on day one. You've already done all the coding work, you don't need to go back and do it, you've done it through your drafting process. So on day one, people can link their business systems to your API and automate their compliance or provide assurance or do the modeling that they need to do. So this gives us a number of really good outcomes. Firstly, we've got a single set of rules being used by multiple users. We have eliminated a lot of inefficiency because now all these people don't need to do their own work to code the rules. This also has the benefit of giving us an assurance role, as we already do with human readable legislation. We have provided assurance for machine readable legislation. But, say, in the regulatory space, we can actually see people consuming our rules. We can see them using our API, so we know that they're complying. 
this makes our life a lot easier because we don't have to go, hmm, I'm not sure whether they're complying or not. We can see the evidence that they are. And we know that their interpretation of the rules is correct because it's our interpretation. So, um, this is the utopian future. Where we are in right now is very much, we are experimenting. Um, getting to this is very difficult. Firstly, you have to have a rules engine. Uh, we're currently working with one called Open Fisco, which was originally designed by the French government to uh, automate taxation policy. Um, we're using it as our rules engine and putting rules into it and building front ends to see how it works, what the problems we run into are. Um, so you might be wondering at this point, why am I telling you all about this? As records managers, as people who deal with data governance, you are dealing with a huge amount of business rules. And a lot of these are very black and white. If your security classification is X, you must do Y. Say, if your data set contains personal information, you must encrypt in transit and encrypt at rest. Those are rules that could be coded. We could, if we are taking a whole of government approach, say, provide those rules in a machine readable form and you could have systems in your own agencies that read those rules and apply them. Uh, so data classification may be automated, perhaps, if you've got a machine learning algorithm that can identify certain, class, uh, certain types of information that can be uh, classified immediately, great. You've got your minimum classification, there are minimum security requirements that go with that. Maybe the application of those security requirements is also automated. There's an opportunity here to build in systems that make these processes seamless, or at least can do a first draft and then escalate for human validation before you press the, uh, press the button. Um, rules as code has a lot of opportunities. It is extremely embryonic. Uh, it, it will not be going into production tomorrow, but we are learning. And there's, uh, it's, it's an exciting time, but what we need now are people who want to come along with the journey with us. So, do I actually have a slide on this? There we go, next steps. Um, this is where we're going next. We are going to continue experimenting, and what that looks like is we are going to identify projects with users within government, people who want to code their rules or who are developing new rules and would like to see what it looks like to code them as they go. Uh, and we are going to use that experience to build a rules as code toolkit. Basically documenting and formalizing the process that you need to go through in order to identify codable rules, code them, and then implement them in a way that is going to be useful. And then finally, we're going to develop an accelerator program to assist people to identify high-value rule sets and to code them. As I said, experimenting, we're definitely looking for people to come and collaborate with us, so if any of this piques your interest, please come and find me afterwards. So, that is the uh, structured part of the presentation. Thank <laughs> you.